Thanks for, thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks to uh, WordCamp for having me here. So, uh, so as you probably uh, saw from the thing, and I guess a lot of you are interested in this topic, I call this talk the back end is dead. And I just want to briefly uh, ask you guys a question. How many of you guys are developers? Or how many of everyone is a developer? I'm trying to reduce my gendered language here. OK. Uh, how many of you consider yourselves uh, to be front end developers? You're probably like, yeah, when you saw this title topic, right? Uh, how many of you consider yourselves to be back-end developers? And then you're like, I want to see what she has to say about this, right? Um, so f how many of you consider yourselves to be full-stack developers? Sweet, sweet. All right, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of story time. So um, I'm pr I, I, my title is full-stack developer, but I primarily do what we would consider back-end work. And, and you know, there's something about me, I guess maybe because I primarily do back-end work that, seeks, that, that sort of seeks to do refactors all the time, right? So, um, so at O3 World, we do, uh, we do work for clients. And it's not always appropriate or effect, cost-effective or time-effective to propose a refactor for any sort of website. So, I, I was looking around for an opportunity to refactor something, because that is sort of how my mind works. And I was like, let me refactor how I think a little bit. Um, and so I, I wanted to, uh, I, I looked around, and especially in the, the projects that I was working uh, more closely on, and it seemed like the traditional lines and how we would divide up how we would work were a little bit blurrier than, you know, sort of just front end development and back end development. And, and you know, how can I sort of best figure out how to delegate tasks when it comes to responsibilities for a project? And you know, how can I help leverage the strengths of, of everyone on my team? So I thought, you know, you know why, are, why on earth are we using these distinctions to, def to continuing to use these distinctions to define ourselves? So um, that's why I call it this, this talk. So, um, when uh, when companies are hiring uh, and agencies are hiring, they post and they post job listings for developers. They're not hiring if they're not hiring for a specific language, say you know PHP or Ruby or or a specific, specific platform like Rails or Groovy or Grails. They're they're hiring for. They usually falls into three categories. You usually have front end developers, back end developers, and full stack developers. So using these categories can be a great way to find talent, but I feel like it can be potentially limiting. So, um, you know, this is, this is pretty much on, you know, I'm gonna preface this by saying, you know, I didn't do a ton of research into this. This was a thought experiment that I used to play out, uh, you know, how I relate to the other developers on my team, and it seems to be working so far. Um, so, what I'm putting forward is a new way to think about the stack when you're hiring developer talent. So I, I hope that this will enable you to truly hire for your needs and assess your business needs, to leverage the wide range of talents on your existing development teams, and then to give developers more opportunities to develop professionally by introducing them to previously unfamiliar workflows or concepts. Does that sound good? Does that sound good? <laughs> So, um, so let's talk about the new stack. So, you know, let's let's replace front end, back end, and full stack with the data layer, the business logic layer, the presentation layer, and the operations layer. So, you know, it might. If you use these four layers to define your stack, it might be more difficult to hire someone who is quote unquote a full stack developer. But if you hire for several, several people who can cover each element of this stack, uh, you'll have more of your workflow covered than if you hired off a traditional stack paradigm. So if you're lucky enough to find someone who actually does cover all four parts of the stack, then you, know, you got yourself a unicorn running in the clouds with rainbows coming out of its butt, I guess. I don't even know what that, I just thought that was really cool, Kev. Um, so let's talk about the stack a little bit. So the data layer. So that's mostly self-explanatory, but I will 
dive a little bit into this. So, you know, you can think of it as, you know, someone who is managing data or someone who is actually making an API or microservice that is connected directly to a, to a data layer. Um, a data layer developer would be able to build or organize data for an application or analyze or, uh, and optimize relationships for the data. And ideally, you know, you would maybe, if, if you were going to you know, try to shoot the moon, you'd want them to be able to write an ORM or a microservice to connect to the data or actually, you know, just sort of own the, the data stack when it comes to a, a project. Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. And then, so then there's the, the business logic layer. The business logic layer, I should put business in parentheses because, uh, you know, not everyone, I mean, I, I personally don't like the phrase business logic, but, you know, it's kind of the al algorithmic layer. I think you're kind of getting my drift here. This is the, the meat, and, meat and potatoes, so to speak. So it's a, how a site works. So I think traditionally people would think about this as back-end work, right? If something, if there's some really complicated, uh, you know, number crunching or data transformation or something of that nature, or even if it's a more complicated version of, of CRUD, you would say this, some of that stuff would sit on the server side and you would think of, you know, server side, client side would be your, your clear delineation between a front end, front end and back end. But I think that, um, you know, as things are shifting and as APIs are becoming more available, more of the logic is actually sitting on the client side. So if someone who's been traditionally what's, what we're calling a back end developer is developing applications that you know, where they're mostly using client-side logic or a framework like Angular or React, then, you know, are they still a back-end developer? Does that distinction even make sense anymore, right? Um, so, you know, in a WordPress shop, this could be someone who creates new plugins, this could be someone who manages a series of, of plugins, who creates custom plugins. Um, it, it, it really varies. Um, it could be someone who does really heavy JavaScript logic. You, it, it, you know, it could, it could really vary. So, um, you know, for, so this is, this, you know, distinction is, this, this is the part where you think, okay, actually someone who is traditionally a front-end developer could, is actually working on a pretty good bit of business logic for an application more so than, than, you know, a, a traditional back-end developer would. The distinction between server-side and client-side seems to be, uh, you know, those, those walls are crumbling, seem to be crumbling a little bit more. So, so someone who can say, so, so then there's the, the presentation layer. I always found that at least in the past, um, the presentation layer, you know, people wouldn't think about the, the presentation layer specifically. It was all lumped into front end. So you'd get everything that basically sat on the play, like everything that you see in front of you is all, uh, is all, uh, you know, it, how it works is the, is the back end and, you know, what you see is the front end. And that's not necessarily clear either. And there's, the presentation layer is, is often, especially now, a lot more complicated than it used to be. Um, so, you know, the presentation, presentation layer, it's the, the stuff you see. So, um, but it's a bit more, it's not just the stuff you see, but it's how the stuff you see works, how you interact with the stuff you see, or not even see, if you're not, if, if you're not visually inclined, if you are, if it's the stuff that you're interacting with, those things that are actually sort of bringing the, bringing the application to life for a user. Um, so you're maybe responsible for converting all those amazing web a assets from the designer. In an agile de designer development shop, shout out to O3 World, right here in Philadelphia. Um, you know, a presentation layer developer who may previously have been a designer, or they may not have, but they speak the language of, of a designer. Um, and, they can, and, and they can, you know, interact with designers very quickly and iterate on things, especially when it comes to developing a web application. So, you know, bonus points to the person who's a specialist in accessibility and keeps non-computer web connected devices in mind during the development process. So, and then there's, a layer that's near and dear to my heart, the operations layer. So that's, that's a lot of text, isn't it? Um, so it's not, it's not traditionally thought of as a, as a part of the stack, but it's an important one. I think people will hire uh, support 
positions and hire uh, like a DevOps positions very much separately from who they hire, you know, from when they're hiring someone who is going to be doing the rest of the de development cycle. And I think you can, you're actually, you might be missing out on a little bit of op an opportunity to cross train someone uh, for that. You could, so, you know, if you have someone doing DevOps that's involved in the development process from its inception, you can avoid a couple pitfalls and headaches related to deployment. and. Chiefly the works for me syndrome. Well, my local, you know, my local Vagrant box, WordPress install, this works perfectly. And it's like, actually, your client is using a different version of PHP. And so that's why everything is all jacked up when you try to deploy it, right? You know, the, the works for me syndrome. You, you avoid that stuff because the uh, uh, operations layer developer will actually think of that sort of thing ahead of time and actually understand what are the what are the what are your clients needs what are your you know your end users needs what are they and and, and sort of keep that into mind the development cycle and help steer the rest of the development of the application based on some of those things so um, so they're responsible for keeping an eye on site builds test coverage updates and patches of software and plugins server hardening security audits deployment workflow disaster recovery so you know, that would be the person who understands the WP Engine ecosystem or Pantheon better than everyone else and can help optimize your project for the use of that in, in your environments. And some of those responsibilities are traditionally fallen to like a, you know, systems, per, systems admin, but as platform as a service becomes more influential and grows in scope, someone, having someone on hand who sort of understands what all that is about can be incredibly useful and that, you know, just because it's difficult to find someone who actually understands what it's like the the day to day to be a developer and understands the operation side might be difficult. It doesn't mean that you know a position like that should go unfilled. Shout out to me. <laughs> um, so, so you know, some of you may be thinking, okay, well, where where do I fit in this paradigm? You know, um, and you know, like like me, you might fit into more than one category and that's totally fair like i you know i i also probably fit into more than one of these categories the lines are even though i i attempted in this thought experiment to make the lines more clear that doesn't make them perfectly clear so you know but i do think that it makes more sense to call myself a business logic operations developer than it does a full stack developer so Um. Sorry, I'm just going through my notes here. So, so you know, if you're if you're into this paradigm at all, uh, like who do you hire, right? Um, well, you know, anyone anyone you want, really. Um, but. Sorry, I love Gibbs and I love Beyonce, so I had to do that. Um, but you may not find you may you may or may not like the specific reconfiguration of the stack. But I hope going forward that you'll do your best not to let titles and categories or even the languages that someone knows limit you into who you limit you uh, limit who you hire. So you know you could be missing out on finding a great fit in your organization if you're paying attention to what previous titles they held or what specific what stacks that whether or not they are actually full stack or not um so you know i could have easily have called this this talk the front end is dead i could have called it uh you know how i learned to stop worrying and love hiring developers i could have called it anything um but you catch my drift i want to empower people to give a deeper read to a resume and cover letter when they're hiring people listen differently in interviews and take risks on people who may not be precisely who you had in mind because i think you will end up having a better team for it so that's actually it <laughs> So I, I left a lot of time for for questions. So um, you know you can ski daddle, or if you have any questions, feel free to ask. No questions is a good thing, I hope. Does any of this make sense to you? No. Yes, you have a question. Um, when you when you talked about the operations layer, I kind of thought you meant just like 
the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. way that end users actually end up using it. Okay. Um, can you kind of speak to sort of where that fits in the stack of like, well, you know, Elaine in HR actually uses this application to XYZ. Right, I, I think to me that would be a little bit more of the presentation layer because I think uh, someone with like a developer with a strong UX and UI sort of bent would fit a little bit better in the presentation layer than the operations layer, but I see, I understand what you mean. Um, I think that with the, um, the operations layer, I'm thinking more of uh, DevOps, but you know that that certainly, you know, again, you know, this is more of a thought experiment, and in and in doing and in thinking of developer, thinking of my team that way, you know, if we had projects where we had a lot of items left to work on, it was easy for me to say, oh, I know that this person, okay, maybe they've only worked in this language or or done these sorts of things, but I know that they have a they have a mind uh, mindset and, and a way of thinking that they could easily solve this problem regardless of whether or not it, it was the the issue, the bug, or the the new feature was on the client side or the server side. So, yes. Hi. So I wanted to know if you could comment for a moment on how you could apply this paradigm to actual interview situations sure. and how you can suss out these different things to match up what you need on your team with okay. the probably miscellaneous skill set that the applicant has. Right. Um, I would probably, excuse me, I would probably, um, you know, in asking them about specific projects that they've worked on, I would want them to go a little bit more in depth in terms of what their responsibilities were on the project. So if they were, if they were like, well, I handled all the client side, blah, 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 for this site. And I was like, well, what actually, oh, is, it a, is it a single page Angular app? And you actually, you know, worked on converting all the data visualizations from like a bunch of, a series of API calls to like some beautiful charts using D3, sweet then like, okay, then like maybe you, maybe you should be working a little bit on the presentation layer and a little bit on, on, the, uh, on the business logic layer. So, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the energetic session. And uh, one thing I think that you have missed, and I was also missing that, was the Steve Harvey. There was no uh, GIF for that. Oh, so. no, Steve Harvey GIF. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I could have so, probably anyways. used some like, family feud stuff yeah. in there. It probably would have been great. But, that, but that's not the question. The question is all about uh, while we are mapping this paradigm onto our development, uh, we come across sometimes with the trainings. Mm -hmm. And the massive trainings, uh, just like I hire a developer, say, for the front end, maybe UI UX, and uh, after a certain time, technologies change altogether. Right. Right. And before that, those were working maybe on the HTML and CSS, and gradually I have to move them towards uh, uh, some JavaScript frameworks and stuff right. like that. So where we can accommodate the training, then retraining, and re-retraining stuff in the whole this paradigm. Where can we accommodate the training in the paradigm? Um, I think that that would be, you know, sort of a, a title shift, right? I mean, I think a lot of, the, like, in the earlier part of the web, you know, JavaScript was used as it was, you know, expedient to delivering HTML and CSS, right? And now you, it's way more complicated. You have front end frameworks and things of that nature. But I think just, um, you know, using this classification to allow someone to grow. I only thought of, you know, someone who could say, I only thought of myself as a front end developer, but now that I've learned Angular and actually learned how to use, make, you know, a, a, or React or, you know, Ionic, I actually learn how to build the bits of an app that actually work or bits of a, a bit of a website that, that works as opposed to, you know, j like some of the things that I, some of the static assets, some of the static things that I see, I can actually, I actually do a bit of the interaction. So it would be a professional, you'd think of it as a professional development thing. So if they retrain, they're, they would shift maybe from a, a front-end developer, from a presentation layer developer into a, say, a business logic developer or be a hybrid of the two. Yes. Where do you see test automation fitting in? Is it most likely to be operations, business logic, or across the, kind of across the board? Across the board. Like, this is... Oh, so um, so I was asked where testing sort of fit in, um, and I would see, say that it fit in across the board. 
Um, so, uh, you know, I think testing is a responsibility of every developer on the team. You know, it's not, not just, you know, for the operations developer that may, may be testing the workflows a little, testing the development workflows or deployment workflows a little bit. That may be, you know, uh, making sure that if, if they're using Git or any other sort of version control system, making, that that, making sure that that makes sense um, to how the rest of the, the team is working. Um, for uh, you know someone who's mostly doing the presentation layer, you know test. You know there are there are test suites for that. You know there's Karma, there's you know um, Phantom. If you want to automate some of this stuff, you know for uh, you know there are any other sort of unit testing for a business logic developer, depending on you know what whether or not you're working on the client side or the server side of the business logic. Um, you know I would say it fits in everywhere. You know there's there are always there's always a shortage of tests. So. Uh, that, yes. As a, as a developer, how do you recommend that we focus on growing? Uh, if you're weak in part of the stack, do you recommend that we concentrate our efforts there or to deepen our strengths? Um, I mean, I think that really... I think that really depends on, like, you know, whether or not you want to grow in that. I think sometimes... The, I think this paradigm sort of gives you the ability to like focus in on what your strength is, but it also gives you the opportunity to grow a little bit, right? So if you're a front-end developer in, in this in original paradigm and just say, you know, you're, you're not as strong in the HTML and CSS, but you're very strong in JavaScript, then, you know, you could either, you know, build up your skills in HTML and CSS or, you know, uh, try to work on more server-side JavaScript if that is something that you're that you're doing as well. So, I mean, I would say that, you know, training yourself and, and you know, there are a lot of amazing tools out there. And I think, you know, this will allow some for room to growth, as, room for growth as like business needs change or projects change. Does that, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Right. Anyone else? No? I guess you guys are going to get out early then. Thank you so much for your time.